Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside you find a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and I have this song on the tip of my tongue. What is it? What is it? On the corner table by the fire are two people. One of them just remembers. If you fall, I will catch you. I'll be waiting time after time. He thinks it's strangely appropriate for this topic. And that's me, Matthew Melema. Uh, welcome to Believe to See. We are a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the front range of Colorado dedicated to a renaissance of the Christian imagination. To find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. Also, when you get the chance, when you have the time, you'll see in a little bit why that's wordplay. Not great wordplay, but wordplay. Please visit um, wherever you get our podcast, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever, and uh, rate and review the show. Uh, we super duper appreciate it. It really increases the visibility, and it doesn't take that much time. Aha. <laughs> I'm just weaving in these themes. Uh, and uh, let me also tell you a little bit about this project that I've been telling you about for a while now, but that's the Why We Create Project which is a, a series that the Anselm Society is running uh, throughout the rest of the year 2022. And that looks at the role that we as human beings play as sub-creators within God's larger created order. So each month, we will look at a specific aspect of that larger theme. And the aspect of the month of June is time. And we have a lot to say about time. A whole lot, and so much time, so little to, no, no. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Mandy Houck, yes. welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Matthew Melema. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me at the table. Um, are there any songs with the word time in them that you have stuck in your head? <laughs> I've had time after time ever since we started preparing for this. Well, I had, if I could save time in a bottle. In my oh, life. that's a good one. Yes, and I'm not going to sing it. But I appreciated yours. I mean, look out, Cindy Lauper. Is that who sang it? Time after time, yeah. Okay, I and originally, but okay. there have been covers. But I, yeah, that's a Cindy Lauper song. Okay, kids, um, young Zoomers listening may not believe this, but when I was in high school, American okay. Idol was cool. So I heard someone do a time after time version on American Idol. So yeah. that's how I was uh, introduced to it. Okay, that's yeah. fair. That's yeah. fair. I was in high school when Cindy Lauper sang it. Well, there so we go. Right. Time. You time. Know. <laughs> Once you get going on <laughs> this is a going. theme, you can find it everywhere, <laughs> which might be just the point. Um, yeah. So originally, for this show, we are going to have uh, Jane Charles joining us as another co-host mm -hmm. uh, because Jane wrote this really fascinating, fantastic article, uh, Finding Meaning in Time. Uh, you can all find it on Anselm Society's website. She posted it uh, late March, and, and it's been sort of the theme, uh, the theme essay uh, for us this month, but, you know, some some podcasts are just star-crossed, you know? Yeah. I've had podcasts where we recorded them twice, each one better than the last, and neither of <laughs> them recorded, uh, and this one, this was just star-crossed. Yeah. where well, she didn't have the time. Yeah, this exactly. She did not have the time, right. and when she did have the time, I didn't have the time, or, you know, yeah. that's, that's how it is. That is. But we thought... You know, we don't need the author here to talk about it. <laughs> this this work exists on its own, independent of Jane, in a sense. Yes. So let's discuss it. So what we're going to do here is we're, we're going to riff on Jane's essay, which is about time in a number of different dimensions, which we'll get into. If you all really want to, what you could do, don't stop this podcast, but pause it. Pause the podcast read the essay, then come back and you can, you can like join along or not. You know, I can't tell you what to do, but, um, <laughs> you can well, try. I can try. But a, a big theme of Jane's essay is basically trying to, as I read it at least, widen our perspective as to what we mean by all of us being in time and uh, trying to shake us free of how a lot of us sort of lazily view time in our, in our day to day existence. Uh, w would you view it that same way, Mandy? What, what did you take as Jane's big points? Yeah, I think her point was that um, at the same time that we, at the same time, man, it really is there. Um, we need like a buzzer or something that we hit whenever we say time. Um, even while we're obsessing over um, time, like, oh, I'm running late. Oh, mm -hmm. I don't have time to finish this or that thing or the other thing. Uh, we also, it's 
um, simultaneously, we don't really think about time in the broader sense. So we just sort of let it be our slave master. Like, I, I think I would say we're slaves to the clock and we don't really think about what time means. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, we, all of us just as people in, you know, our, our modern age, uh, talk about time all the time. <laughs> Gosh, I didn't even mean to do that. I know. And I we're just going to have to accept that it's going to happen and a few more times. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we don't really think about what we mean by that or if there's other maybe healthier or more full ways to view that. So I wanted to look, especially for us, you know, as either artists or, you know, for, for those of those listeners who may not be actively engaged in making art, who, who enjoy, you know, experiencing the art, the arts or anything like that. What are ways that we can view time based on the arts, based on story, that can maybe help us make sense, not only of Jane's essay, right. but of the way we go about our lives in time? Mm -hmm. So let, let's start with some, one of the big themes I saw from, from Jane was this concept of the different types of time. Mm -hmm. when, when we use time today as sort of, you know, modern, industrialized people or whatever, we really mean what the, the ancients would call chronos. So, so we get chronological from, where it's like one second following another, picture that the second hand sweeping on a clock, one day turning to the next, you know, uh, the, the, the linear time that we, we picture just going forward until death or whatever. <laughs> And that is an important aspect of time, but it's also not the only aspect where they, they'd also have, among other things, uh, Kairos time, which doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean the, the linear time, but it means something like the appropriate time, the fitting time. Mm -hmm. So something like the day of the Lord from like the Old Testament, that would be like the, the time of the, of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So that is a thing that I think is very hard intuitively to picture on its own. But what we were discussing earlier, how it makes a little bit more sense when we view it through the lens of like folks who write or read or you know consume fiction in some ways, right, Mandy? Right. Yeah, definitely. Because we, you read the story and you're not really obsessed with um, the ticking of the clock through the story, and the story exists as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the way a lot of us again sort of lazily conceive of this, we think of things in the past as gone, you know, like mm -hmm. they're, they're all, what was it? Tuesday's gone with the wind, <laughs> my babies. Okay. I don't know that one. That's by, uh, what was it Leonard Skinner? Oh, yeah. oh, wow. Okay. Didn't know that. All I know is Sweet Home Alabama. I could be making stuff up for it's all I know. It's um, but th this idea that things that happened in the past are just gone. It's dead. Right. Well, like the sands in the hourglass. You know, so, so are, are the, the days, days of, of our lives. lives. Yes. Because wow, we are just getting so many highbrow uh, artistic references oh, right here. Oh yes. <laughs> Cindy Lauper, Leonard Skinner, Days of Our Lives. Uh, but anyway, so things in the past are gone. Things in the future aren't here yet. So all we have now is just sort of this fleeting, cutting edge of sensory moments or whatever. Right, and then we, and then because all we're thinking about is the past that we can't undo and the future that we're unsure of, I think we we don't exist in the present. Yeah. Yeah, I think, was it Augustine? He was talking about sort of this view of time where he considered like the present that which is soon not to be. Oh. So, so it's sort of like this, this sort of cascading series of nows and nows and nows that all just keep uh, going back into the past. Oh, wow. Now, obviously Augustine would, I dare say Augustine would agree with Jane's uh, essay here. I think so. But he was just describing that, that sort of view of it. Right. But when we take it back to the, like, picture somebody reading a novel. Mm -hmm. As you read a novel, in a sense, you're seeing the, the series of words go, these series of words are creating images in your head, and, you know, it's, it's going together. But you wouldn't say, once you reach the end of the book, that the stuff in the earlier parts of the book are, are like, gone or are, are irrelevant. Right. They still very much exist. And if you maybe make the point a little bit more sharper and expand it to the author, when you're writing a book or, or you know, composing a song or you know, doing a painting, you don't think, oh, uh, that, all that stuff I wrote earlier is in the past and it's gone. It's like, in a sense, the whole thing exists for you at once. Right. 
So you can, you can take the book you've written, look at the beginning, look at the end, you know, bounce back in between, and it all exists in one, in one moment for you as, as the reader or as the author. Right. So that, that might be a more accurate view of time when we're like looking at it in the big picture, maybe not how we as an individual human, you know, trapped in this, in this, this world with, uh, with, with all of its chronos, mm -hmm. but that might be, you know, the way God would see it. Right. And I mean, I wonder, I, I mentioned in the green room, I mentioned this to you, that um, I wonder how much of our obsession with time is Western and American. Well, I mean, I don't wonder. I know it's, <laughs> I know it is um, more of an issue for, for the Western mm -hmm. cultures, um, just sort of the slave to the clock, as I said before, um, and that... Um, like a race it's mm -hmm. you know and and there's language to, you know we're in the rat race or the yeah so um and if i could go back in time i would start this thought over because <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming mush in my mouth but no i don't know how well that came out well but, the thing yeah. is you in the past beginning that thought Yes. in a sense, still exist. Oh, okay. And so does you in the future when you finish the thought. Okay. Right? You could, like, if, if from outside of time, if we were to step outside of our cosmos and look at it, all are existing. <laughs> it's just as much Mandy starting this thought as it is Mandy ending the thought that you're about to begin right now. Right. And regretting the way in which I <laughs> expressed it. No. <laughs> I can tell you seemed really self-conscious about every word coming out of your mouth. I know. Now, this is retreating. Yes. <laughs> eternally into the infinite void of the past. I know. Is this a heavier burden? <laughs> I don't know. I thought we were supposed to help ourselves. And yeah. Um, so back to being trapped in time. Yeah. But I, I agree with what you're saying there with, you know, I, I would say this probably applies to anyone in, in you know, an industrialized country, which... Every year is more and more of the world's population. Now yes. it's pretty much everyone. Um, where, you know, even in the last couple hundred years with the advent of things like the watch or right. the secondhand or standardized time, mm -hmm. where now it's not every single village has its own sort of quirky idiosyncratic time. Now mm -hmm. the whole time zone, we know exactly what time it is, down to the nanosecond. Things run based on seconds. All of us have work that begins at a specific time. Mm -hmm. uh, this TV show lasts a specific amount of time. Um, for a lot of lawyers, when they're billing, <laughs> Whew, this was this weighs heavily on our minds. Uh, I, I don't bill in my current job, which yeah. which is a nice oh, thing. That's nice. But uh, a lot of lawyers bill their time in increments of six minutes, and wow. they have very heavily regulated. We expect you to bill this many hours in a year, which means X amount of hours per month, X amount of hours per week, per day. Right. It can get to you after a while. X and, amounts of six minute blocks. Yeah, and you know that in back in the day, before I doubt that Abe Lincoln kept. Mm -hmm track of his time in increments of six minutes right you know in a sense because we got more efficient with our technology certain occupations law among the many many other examples you could have have gotten way more stressful right that's true and also i i remember watching a documentary at some point i do watch them i like them but i remember <laughs> i watched one that was talking about the um transcontinental railroad mm -hmm. and that was a large um, impetus for the obsession with exact time yeah. because all the trains had to run and so all the, all the station masters had their pocket watches and that, that the, tr the train industry I guess is a large part of why we became more meticulous with mm -hmm. timekeeping so yeah, yeah so I'll give you an example of what happened just now you know, like when I was, so we're, we're recording this in, in Mandy's kitchen. So I was driving over and for this excuse and that excuse, which I can make, I ended up being like three minutes late. And as I'm driving up, I have my GPS, which shows like this made time of till destination. I'm looking at the clock. It's like, oh gosh, it's nine minutes until 3, 3 p.m., which is when we were supposed to be here. And it says I'm 12 minutes away. And so like this... <laughs> I didn't think you'd like blow up at me for being three minutes late. No. But just this fact that like, it's in the back of my head like, Ooh, I'm going to commit a, a minor social faux pas <laughs> made possible. And I, the only reason I have any knowledge of this is through the very advanced technology that all of us have in our cars. Exactly. Yeah. The obsession with time. And I do that with my GPS. I like look at my ETA and, yep. and then you get in a traffic jam and it slips back a minute. Yep. And, uh, then you find an open spot. like, I'll make up the time. I'll make it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so, so yeah, I mean, long, 
long and short of it is a lot of us feel trapped, whether we realize it or not, in this sort of day-to-day -day thing. Like it's it's so commonplace, you, you barely even would hear someone say anymore like, oh, there aren't enough hours in, in the day. <laughs> like we all feel that way all the time, right? Yeah. But let's go through some more examples of how looking at story, looking at different aspects of fiction can maybe help correct our vision. I, I think it's uh, kind of similar to what we were talking about with the Fae or not Fae episode. Yes. Where a lot of fairy stories, one of their many benefits is they, they correct your vision. Instead of thinking of this sort of dead mechanical world, it's, it helps us rightly see that the world is enchanted in a lot of ways. Right. Where, so I think in a similar way, looking at some of these examples that, that Jane would cite in her article or that we should be citing soon, uh, it helps break us of the habit of thinking the only thing about time is it's uh, this succession of moments that are only moving in one direction and can't do anything else. Right. Mm -hmm. So th there's the aspect of like I said, the, the novelist go, who again, looking at I, th this is one of the best ways I can try to get my head around it. Because mm -hmm. when we talk about getting out of chronological time, I don't think any of our human brains really work that way. Right. So we're like trying to teach a gerbil calculus. It's like <laughs> it, its brain can't fit the concept. So mm -hmm. the one that helps me is again, looking at the novel. The novel in a sense exists all at the same time, all at once to someone reading it or especially like someone writing it. Mm -hmm. But another thing would be again, this distinction between Kronos and Kairos where again, chronos, chronological time, kairos meaning the, the appropriate, the right time. Mm -hmm. I would say a huge part of fiction writing, uh, regardless of the medium, is trying to work up to the kairos point. Yes. C c does that make sense, Mandy? Would that be similar to what you would do? Oh, it absolutely makes sense. And I was just thinking like, can you imagine if you tried to write a novel in perfect chronological time? Mm -hmm. um, it would be really boring. Because, I mean, you know, you even skip over if you have your character answering the phone. You don't have mm -hmm. them say, hello, this is blah, blah, blah. You skip the stuff that doesn't matter, even though it does take time if it were in the real world. Can so, I jump in really quick? Because yeah. because that, that is a, that's a great point. And it made me think of this random video I saw. So in the days following, in the years following Seinfeld, uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus um, was on this very short-lived sitcom. But I forget the name of it. Was it The New Adventures of Old Christine? Or no, was it, it was one before one? that. Before that? Yes. Okay, I will but Google the, the premise in the first season was that every episode would happen in real time. Well, they did that with 24. Yeah, the, yeah. so, so they, they did do that with 24. Mm -hmm. But they, they took it, they did, this is probably an artistic mistake, but for this uh, <laughs> show, which is supposed to be a, a sitcom, right. you can kind of see sort of a proto Curb Your Enthusiasm in it, sort okay, of. Okay, okay. But Every episode would take place, it was like 22 minutes, they'd have a countdown clock. Okay. And so the viewers could see how much time there was left and wow. they don't cut at all. So like you'd see, you'd see her like, um, you know, walking down, if she has to walk down a hallway and walk down a staircase to exit the building, you'd have to see it, oh my even gosh. if it's not helpful to the plot. Wow. That, I could see that sounding cool if you're a certain type of writer yeah. But in practice, it didn't work because like you said, you, you have to cut stuff as an author. You can't, it's not in, like if, if we were to film a scene of me here today, I'm not going to, you're not going to have the 15 seconds it takes for me to walk to your kitchen door to the outside door because right. that's irrelevant stuff. Right. A lot of this for fiction writing is, is editing. You can't just have chronos time. Correct. Was the name of the show watching Ellie? That's the one. Okay, well, we, so we had to watch her do every single thing. Yeah, it was okay. watching Ellie for 22 minutes. Well, <laughs> exactly see, the 22. Reason, the only reason that 24 worked is for one thing, they weren't, they would, um, there would be different scenes or mm -hmm. settings. So you weren't following Kiefer Sutherland the yeah. whole time. But also the tension was heightened at all times. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just somebody walking down a hallway. So. Um, but in, in reality, the, the, there are moments that matter that have heavier weight mm -hmm. than others. Mm -hmm. And we have to try to capture that in our fiction so that our readers don't nod off and go to sleep and put our book down. Yeah, exactly. You can't, yeah, you can't just present life in real speed and expect that to have any artistic merit. Right, and I mean, in a similar way, the still life, ooh, still life is like a perfect yeah. um, 
a still life as a Kairos painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It really is. Because it matters what the light is from the window beside mm -hmm. the bowl of lemons. Um, so that, that matters. The moment that is being captured on the canvas um, it better be a Kairos moment or it's not going to have a lot of meaning. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Or it's the same thing with like a photographer, you know, picture right. them out with the photo session, you know, this family or a couple or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to get like one one thousandth of a second captured. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. That's that one Kairos moment. That's all we want. Right. You don't want to see me and me and my family trudging up the this little path to this <laughs> pretty little mountain spot. You want the one instant. Right. With the light, with the golden hour, as they say. Oh, it's always golden it's hour. It has to be golden yes. hour. Yes. So I, I said this in the green room, and I, I think you weren't quite sure if it was right, but okay, I was trying to define fiction as, it's sort of like life with only the Kairos and none of the Kronos. So basically life yeah. with the Kronos cut out. Do you think that yeah. sounds fair? I do, I don't remember you saying that. If I looked like I didn't agree, maybe it's because I wasn't listening. <laughs> That makes me feel better. Don't worry, Matt. It's not that I disagree with you. I, I wasn't, wasn't listening, listening to, to you. you. Sorry. I don't remember you saying that. Were you saying it when my dog was whining and I was trying to put him it in could the be. room? It, it could be. It could be. But anyway, now anyway, that you listen to it. All that to say, I do. I No, I absolutely agree with that. But as humans, we are trapped in Kronos. Mm -hmm. So we have to trudge through the Kronos moments um, and hopefully stay attuned enough to our surroundings and... Um, you know, the Imago Day in other people mm -hmm. and to, to grasp the Kairos. You can't, and I think, particularly with like social media and Instagram, I think we feel like every moment is supposed to be a Kairos moment now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, um, I remember having little, little tiny babies. <laughs> That's yeah. the Instagram's new slogan make every moment Mom, a, Kairos a Kairos moment. moment yes. <laughs> what does your latte look like? Kairos moment. Yeah. Click, click. Oh, you took a sip, and now the cream is smeared. You should take another picture. No, um, sorry. Um, but even before, you know, when my kids were little, there wasn't any. There was. There were computers, and there was the internet, but there wasn't social media per se. Um, <clears throat> but I remember just this sense of time slipping away, hmm. and like trying to make every moment matter intensely like what amazing event can i take my children to yeah. and um you know i ask my kids now and I'll, I'll tell them i'm like i wish i had done more of this or that or the other thing and they tell me they're in their 20s now and they just tell me no but i remember and they'll mm -hmm. name some moment that was totally yeah. unorchestrated that i didn't try to make meaningful but it you know you yeah. can't, we can't orchestrate our lives down to the um, nitty gritty like that. Yes, every moment cannot be Kairos. If every moment mattered equally, we would die a lot younger. It'd be exhausting. That's that's a very <laughs> good point. That's a very good point. I have been feeling something similar to mm -hmm. that. I, I would tell you the past couple weeks. <clears throat> okay. This is one of my quirkier. Uh, I have a lot of quirky views on oh, things, but this is one aware. of my quirkier things. We are aware. My favorite time of the year mm -hmm. is this period, the last two weeks of May and the first two weeks of June. Okay. So it's like early summer, the trees just have leaves, it's okay. warm, but it's not super hot yet, summer's just getting going. So you remember like when you're a school kid and you're like, summer break just started the whole <laughs> summer stretching out. So I just love it so much that sometimes, you know, like, you know, I'll have a busy week of work during this time, or I won't be able to get outside, or, you know, there's smoke in the air from, you know, wildfires or whatever. I'm like, oh, it's slipping away. Like right now, we are recording this on June 14th. So literally tomorrow is the last day of my favorite time of the year. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but So by the time this is published, you will be... By the time you're hearing this, listeners, it's no longer my favorite time of the year. Oh. Yeah, crushing. Crushing. But uh, yeah, there is this sense of like time is slipping through my fingers mm -hmm. so i find myself like sitting on the porch mm -hmm. as like the sun setting being like soak it in soak it in this will all be over soon <laughs> doesn't lend itself well to enjoying it that's true well and that's funny that you this is a little bit off topic seemingly because when we when we were in the green room we weren't talking exclusively about this but we were talking about amsterdam and this is reminding me of what i said about when we were peter mm -hmm. and i were in rembrandt's house and I just felt this tension the entire time because I didn't feel like I was, I didn't know how to 
fully realize I was mm-hmm. in Rembrandt's house. And so I just <laughs> went through like with this, like my brain was like tight the whole yes. time, like a must, like a tight muscle. Cause I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm as aware of where I am and how old this house is and that Rembrandt stood on these floors. I, I can't soak it in well Soak enough. it in now, now. Soak it in. Ah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think we, because we try so hard to make things matter, we, we make the mattering more important. And, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and again, let, c- circling that back around to, you know, to story, mm-hmm. it's that same thing where when, I, I think one of the big things that always gets me between first draft and second draft mm-hmm. is editing. Like <laughs> right now I've gotten into this habit Who knows how long it'll last? It's been like two weeks so far. So far, so good. Where I'm trying to write a first draft of another book, and I've explained to you before I don't like writing first drafts. But I'm trying to get it. I have an hour a day where I'm going to sit down, and my goal is to like challenge myself to write as many words as I can. Right. So like just for that one hour, bleh. (laughs) And I'm getting decent results. But what I'm noticing is I get the feeling when I go back and look through it, there's going to be a lot of Chronos in there. You know, like just when you're in, when you're in like this, this flow state, which, which can be really good. Like I've, I've had a lot of good ideas, at least I think, <laughs> yeah, writing in that process, but it's also led to a lot more stuff than the story probably ultimately needs. Mm-hmm. So I will find just between like draft one and draft two, again, draft one is throwing it up, you know, throwing the clay right. and uh, draft two is starting to cut the clay off. There's a ton mm-hmm. that can come out and it's almost all this chronos time where it's like okay do i need the character walking from the cafeteria to his classroom Mm -hmm. no do i need this no like in i don't frame it this way but you almost could no that's chronos Mm -hmm. i just need the the the, i i don't need all that chronos there right but like you were just saying like sometimes when you're allowing yourself to just write the chronos you happen upon new ideas yes and so i mean we could you know put that in the context of life, Mm -hmm. we shouldn't be, um, I don't know, bitter about the drudgery necessarily because that God is with us always. And if we're paying attention, we'll notice him Mm -hmm. if we don't try to eschew the drudgery and make everything um, memorable and Instagram worthy all the time. Yes. So, but yeah, I really, I, I like, you're right. That editing very often is the cutting out. And Conversely, because as I was growing up, I was always told to stop talking. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Get to the point, Mandy, get to the point. was what I was always told. And so that has actually been a struggle I've had to overcome as a writer. Like the first draft of my first novel was like 40,000 words. Oh. And I thought, I was like, no. So you write, you write, you write short in your first drafts. I did. Okay. Well, I do. I do. I, I have a harder time. I have so, and I, John Steinbeck could do forty thousand words. I think yeah. Mice and Men is right around there. But yeah. I am not John Steinbeck as of yet. So <laughs> no one has compared me to him. Growth mindset, Mandy. Point. Growth mindset. Okay, but um, so for me, I think I get bogged down by trying to make every single thing matter, mm-hmm. and um. And I need to be, I need to give myself permission to sort of spread out and mm. include more reality um, and not edit myself before I even get it out Oh, there. that's that's interesting. So you're kind of presenting like the, the equal and opposite problem. Right. Whereas like early drafts of mine, it's like so much Kronos, mm-hmm. where yours, it's like all the tippy top Kairos. Well, it was, but, yeah. I, but so every now and then when I'm writing now, um, I will feel that kind of sneaking back in, yeah. sort of the tendency. Oh, don't you don't have to describe? I don't know the sunset on every single day, or what? And, and of course, I don't. Don't worry, I don't do that. But anyway, I'll ju- I'll just hear myself saying, "Oh, you don't need to. You don't need to say that. You mm-hmm. leave that out." But then I push back. I and I'm like, you know, I'm just going to write it, and I can take it out later if yeah. I need to take it out later. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I guess there's kind of two sides to to that. The first mm-hmm. is 
again, especially in like the writing context, or, or I'm sure this would apply to other art forms as well. It's mm -hmm. like you need to make sure that everything in there serves some purpose, mm -hmm. right? Like it's really easy. Uh, I think a lot of folks, when they just get started writing, I'm sure I did this when I started, is you, you pile on the adjectives because you think oh, that's gosh, what because yes. you think that's what makes for fancy writing. You'll have yes. like five adjectives to describe, you know, the, the way someone walks across the mm -hmm. the lawn. Where it's like, no, no, no. Maybe pick one adjective, mm -hmm. the one that's like the most unusual, or the most descriptive, and go with that. Or, or, or maybe just pick an interesting verb. Pick a better, yeah, better yeah. noun, a better verb. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. I so, did that in my creative writing class. I would write a sentence on the board, and I would use a bunch of adjectives and adverbs, um, and plain nouns and verbs, and I would challenge them to con condense, take my two adjectives plus the noun yeah. and make it one noun. Yeah, and that's, it's really interesting to sort of conceptualize, especially within like this, conceptualizing it after reading through Jane's essay, mm -hmm. where it's like you can picture like the mind inside, you know, any author or, or a reader. It's like, okay, let's, let's picture a pickup truck. You know, it's the mm -hmm. pickup truck, all the adjectives that in your mind could truthfully be ascribed to it. Okay. It's red, it's rusty, it's beat up, it's dusty, it's old, it's blah, 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 almost, Noisy, almost, blabby. yeah, almost to infinity, mm -hmm. almost to yeah. infinity. Yeah. So from all this stuff, pick out like one adjective, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that is something that takes a lot of work as, as a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the many reasons why it's good to draft and redraft, because usually you'll come up with better words as you go. Right. And it also shows, yeah, it's, Jane, if you're listening, I'm probably, you, just taking your Kairos Kronos distinction way far afield. Sorry, but <laughs> it's star cross. You couldn't be here to defend yourself. <laughs> it's almost like, no, no, no. Pick the one Kairos word, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one that is appropriate. It serves the function. It advances the overall narrative. Right. Yeah. yeah and then, then uh, another point related to it is Kairos is sort of like the, the climax of a narrative. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, traditionally, you know, we're taught that. The, the action should be leading up to one sort of final crisis point, like the climax. Right. And so in a sense, all the seeds you place in the earlier, whether it's the opening, whether it's the middle build, etc., is leading up to this one point. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you could say that each story has its one kairos point, mm -hmm. and everything is either working toward it or in the, or or in the denouement. denouement. Is it the denouement? Denouement. You gotta put I the used N to, in there. I used Mom. to think it was the denouement. <laughs> but apparently, apparently no. no. Um, the denouement. Yeah, ma. No, you gotta get the N in there, ma. Denouement. <laughs> okay, now Jane is really rolling over, and whatever, because she actually speaks <laughs> French. So, <laughs> okay, hi Jane. Anyway. Uh, um, anyway, so so yeah, yeah, so so again, it's either working toward that one point or or the you know usually the the very short denouement, working from <laughs> it, right? Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. But. Like you were saying before, I mean, if the only thing that mattered was the Kairos moment, then you would say, oh, well, we can just describe this one Kairos moment. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it only matters because of yes. everything that came before. And the resonance happens because of the denouement that comes yeah. after. Let, let, let's take an example. Okay. Again, since you're Anselm listeners, obviously y'all like Harry Potter. So the <laughs> climax of the entire story if you look at it, in my view, correctly, it's the <laughs> chapter, spoiler alert, but come on. Um, it's the chapter when Harry decides to give himself up to Voldemort, to sacrifice himself for his friends. Yeah. That chapter when he's walking from Hogwarts out to the woods to meet Voldemort, that's the climax. Yes. Yes. You could, I'm sure, J.K. Rowling could have had a short story in this separate universe mm -hmm. that is very well written and everything, and it's beautiful and everything and it would have some power mm -hmm. but the fact that we had those like seven and four fifths like six and four fifths books leading mm -hmm. up to it mm -hmm. to this point where you get to know the character you get to know the context you get to know the stakes you go on the journey with you're him. going on the journey with him all of that in service of this one kairos point makes that all the much more powerful mm -hmm. i think that's really good because 
you know, we, we can tell when we're reading a book, when we're getting to the, like the last half inch, uh-huh. for those of us who read actual physical books, of course. Anyway, I wouldn't know what you're, you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> anyway, um, when you, it's, isn't there like a progress bar? There at the is. Bottom? Okay, so, you know, <laughs> whatever. The analogy works. When you get to the end, you know when you start a book mm-hmm. that it's going to take a while before you get to the climax. And, but in our own lives, we don't, necess- we don't know really Mm -hmm. um and so but it's too easy for us i think to discard the moments that we're just living as if they don't matter because we don't know yeah uh, what's imbued in them yeah if that makes sense maybe your ordinary boring drudgery seeming stuff is actually leading up to something very good and you Mm -hmm. just don't see it right now right Yeah. yeah just like uh some early uh, Quidditch match with, with Harry. <laughs> or like a Quidditch practice that's barely mentioned in the book. It's actually yeah. in greater service to the final Kairos. Just doesn't seem that way at the time. Yeah. All right. So yeah. that's, that's one of the, I think, the core things as, again, whether you're an artist or whether you're someone who just enjoys stories and how those impact you, uh, uh, maybe a good way of visualizing it. Something else I wanted to discuss um, in some detail, okay. just because, you know, we are, of course, we're good Anselmers. <laughs> uh, Jane talked a lot about uh, work of Charles Williams, work of C.S. Lewis. So the most famous inkling and the weirdest inkling uh, together and how <laughs> they use time. So like uh, in Narnia, what, that? What, what were your impressions about that and how this sort of stepping out of time can be portrayed artistically? Well, I mean, I remember as a kid, I I read Narnia pretty early in my little elementary years, and that was one of the most fascinating things to me, was the, um, that when the Pevensies are in Narnia, they're getting older, I mean, they're there for decades, and Mm -hmm. then they come back and they haven't changed at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not really sure exactly why that is such a fascinating, it's just something interesting to think about, and... um, so it's, I don't know. I, I remember just trying to imagine how could two worlds exist at the same time, but their time time would not run at the same point. And then it's funny now because as an older person, I think when they come out of the wardrobe, I, it makes me feel kind of tired. Like they're like, oh no, I'm a kid again. I'm just right all over. <laughs> <laughs> oh crap. No. I, I know. But anyway, yeah, I, I just think that's a fascinating um I don't know. I don't want to say device because that sounds derogatory, but it's a it's a I, it's a device for for us to really stop and think what um, what does time how does time impact us mm-hmm. and I don't know. When did you read the Narnia books? I was a little bit older because um, I talked about this in the last podcast I recorded mm-hmm. um, when I was about eight, Uh I had the misfortune of happening upon uh, the cartoon version of The Hobbit, like the really creepy one in in like the 60s. there's a whip, there's a way. And um, (laughs) I I had the greater misfortune of seeing the scene where uh, Bilbo is being threatened by Gollum, and that terrified me so much. I was scared away from all of fantasy literature for the next like five five or so years. Oh no! So uh, I came I came to it like uh, well, I was like fourteen or something. Okay. So so that would be interesting because I think I was around eight when I was reading it and and so it really captured my mm-hmm. young because I think we all can agree that our imaginations are a lot more pliable mm-hmm. and um, we're a lot more willing to suspend disbelief. We're not the, the cynicism hasn't started to. to Harden us. Yeah, and, I, um, I, I, and so I oh. was just so fascinated by that. Um, by that time, do you remember reacting to that at all as a fourteen-year-old reading it, the Pevensies? Yeah, I don't remember my specific reaction, but I, I do think, you know, go, going through it, it, it's it is that sort of idea of the the retraining that that mm-hmm. we were talking about, where uh, Lewis wrote, wrote other in other places. Again, Jane discusses some of these about you know, how God is outside of time. You know, mm-hmm. I think in Mere Christianity, which was written in like, what, 1940 or so, C.S. Lewis was like, you know, to God, it's still 1920 and already 1960 or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and uh, talking about examples from like, you know, classical theology or, or philosophy about how God can sort of 
view time as like someone viewing a city from a tall hill. Like they can view oh. the whole thing spread out before them at once. I like that. So Lewis definitely had this view. Again, I'm sure Lewis would have uh, signed on to everything you said, Jane. <laughs> but, um, and, and this is a good way to, to illustrate that, mm. where, you know, why can't there be two worlds where time moves at different, different rates, or where the, the experience of Kronos by characters in this realm might be different from the experience in this other one? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good way to start our brains uh, retraining. Well, there's a really good, fairly recent book by Matt Haig, who's a British writer, and he wrote um, The Midnight Library. He also wrote How to Stop Time, which is really good. Oh, the, there we go again. Anyway, but in The Midnight Library, the library is all the moments of decisions that this one woman has made, and she gets to go back to them and see I'm, I'm oversimplifying it. Bethany, if she listens to this, she's going to be like, that's not it. But anyway, <laughs> read it and you'll understand. But it's like the, these books that have moments of regrets and mm -hmm. she can go back and um, it's sort of like the choose your own adventure. What if you had done a different thing? What would what would your moments, your life look like after that? So, th so I, I think it is, I, if you stop and think about it, there are a lot more um, literary works that play with time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously the Time Traveler's Wife, but and you know H.G. Wells. Um, but I really liked one of my favorite parts about um, Jane's essay was right after she was talking about Narnia. She was talking about the um, when a child is utterly absorbed in play, mm -hmm. and they're sort of outside of time when they're absorbed in play. And how upset they get when you stop them. And this, the same thing, I mean, that happens when I'm having a really good writing day. Mm -hmm. I will be stunned. I'll look at my watch and I'm like, I've been writing for how long? Maybe that's why I'm thirsty. You know, like you forget, you forget things. Um, on a bad writing day, I'm, you know, it's like plodding along and I've only been writing for 10 minutes. So it's, I think there's that, um, because we are it created in the image of God, so there is sort of this magical way that our minds, we can escape from the clock, from the ticking of the clock, when we're really engaged in, in the eternal, um, and whatever it is that we're called to do. The mystical playtime is the way that... Um, Jane puts it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, and for, for me, yeah, it, it doesn't happen all the time in our or even most times. But right. sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you'll kind of lose yourself and mm -hmm. you're like, whoa, what, what, huh? <laughs> and it's it's really great. And oh, I, I love it. <laughs> I think there's actually been some research confirming this, you know, for, for whatever that's worth. I think the, the term they used was like when you're in flow. So mm -hmm. using it for like musicians, so like really great guitar players report this. I, I think like, um, uh, uh, T Teresa from the Arts Guild has said she mm -hmm. she feels this sometimes when she's uh, playing her guitar and singing, where it's mm -hmm. like you're kind of forgetting yourself. You're, you're sort of outside of time. You lose track of time because you're kind of outside of it in in that sort of thing. It's it's a really it's a very cool glimpse in a very cool like sliver of uh, like being able to see. Ooh, let's go Lewis some more. Being able to see by the light instead of just seeing the light for for that go. brief glimpse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's there's a little bit a little bit of Lewis, and I, I'll add also. Um, you mentioned this that a lot of artists play with time a lot, and I, I think this especially happens to novels. And there's so many ways that they can play with time. Mm -hmm. There's the the form like the flashback, you know, like for you can yes. go back to Homer where it's done in medius medius race. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. There you go. Where basically it starts midway through and then a huge portion of the book is basically flashbacks. Mm -hmm. That's really playing with time. So it's framing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, or like framing. It's like, so there's sort of a story within the story. Both mm -hmm. kind of exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, a lot of uh, stream of conscious novels will do this where they just jump in and out of time periods. Right. And that's really cool. One, because I think it's how human memory works. Mm -hmm. You don't think of things in chronological series all kind of lumped together. Oh, I like that. In two, it shows sort of this, maybe a more correct view of time, where it's not sort of laid out on a ruler, it's all sort of there at once. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Well, and back to Matt Haig, mm -hmm. um, several of his books are sort of playing with um, 
different ways of bending time or mm-hmm. revisiting time. And I'm, one of his more famous books was actually a memoir called Reasons to Stay Alive. And it was about his struggle with suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. And so I, to me, I think that's probably why he is now so obsessed with times because he had that, um, that experience of addiction and um, depression and anxiety. And so he's using his art to sort of work out mm-hmm. um, the magic of time. Yeah, that's that's a good way to I phrase it too. I highly recommend him. He's he's really good. Yeah, yeah. and so we're we're running a little low on on uh, time. time. Yeah, oh. uh, I could see the end of the sentence at the beginning. I was like, oh no. <laughs> but <laughs> you could see the end from the beginning. Wow. Oh gosh. <laughs> we can't get away from it. We, we can't. We really can't. Um, so really, I, I just sort of has some tangential thoughts related to this. Again, there, there's a, a few minor riffs on Jane's article, which again, you should pause and read, then come back to it. Mm-hmm. Um, just thinking about how these concepts of, you know, humans always feeling sort of trapped in time, always feeling this anxiety that they will just disappear. Uh, you can see it e- even in the earliest literature, like the, the first real literary work we have, the Epic of Gilgamesh, what's Gilgamesh so bummed out about? That he's going to die someday, right? (laughs) So he's trying to find a way to be immortal. He finally gets this flower that will at least keep him alive for a lot longer. Then, spoiler alert, that gets eaten by a snake. So he's, you know, and he's trying to, the end, it's kind of ambiguous, but seems like, because we only have tablet fragments, but you see Gilgamesh back at his kingdom looking like, wow, you have some really cool walls around my kingdom. This isn't half bad. It's almost like this sort of, <laughs> well, I'll live on through this city, so it's okay. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Or, you know, look at Achilles in the Iliad, where his very famous choice is you can either live a long and happy life of obscurity, or you can have a short, brilliant life where your name will live on in history. Right. So that's sort of his idea of living on. It's his name will live on, right? which maybe if we're looking at it as sort of a, an ever present or, or whatever, like maybe he has a point. Well, we're talking about him. We are talking about him. <laughs> but um, there he is. Do, do you, how, how would you, how should we view this in light of, in light of Jane's article? In light of the, Jane's this, uh, this obsession that so, seems so ubiquitous among literature. It's like, I'm going to try to create fame. I'm going to try to, you know, sort of achieve some form of immortality through recognition, through deeds, through whatever, like basically try to have one awesome Kairos. Mm -hmm. So when all my Kronos is gone, that'll still be there. Well, I mean, if you think about it, that's immortality is just being utterly free of time. Yeah. That time has absolutely no um, bearing on you whatsoever (laughs) because yeah, there's no end. Because time implies a beginning and an end, yeah. but eternity doesn't. So maybe Obviously. we could view it as sort of like a, a shadow of the right idea. Mm-hmm. Whereas like as, as Christians, we would say, hey, we're, we're stepping outside of time into eternity. Mm-hmm. Whereas for the, the sort of the Achilles or Gilgameshes of the world, it's, it, there's, yeah. a, there's a little something. You know, they, right. they want their name to mm-hmm. survive them. The rest of them's gone, but at least they have their name. So they have that little, little right. shadow, but it's a shadow of the... the greater truth maybe. Well, this is reminding me of when we had the heaven podcast, we were, mm-hmm. all the, um, all the examples of art and literature and TV, if that's art, I guess, good place. Um, they were so limited on how they can mm-hmm. conceive of heaven. Yeah. Um, because really, if you think about it for, um, Achilles to want to, is that who you were saying was wanting to mm-hmm. put his stamp? Yeah, to put his stamp on the world, then I'll live forever. Well, on um, Newsflash, the world isn't going to be around forever. <laughs> so, I mean, so really, it, it's just the temporal immortality, which isn't really immortal. Ooh. The, 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 <laughs> the aliens who will one day blow up our planet from across the solar system, they don't care what Achilles did at Troy. No. <laughs> they no. don't care that he slew Hector. No, uh, spoiler don't. alert. Um, <laughs> Man, this is, you're going to have to put oh. a spoiler alert on the description of this podcast. But, but yeah, so yeah. in, yeah, that, uh, again, going back to that same thing where you can see maybe the, the first hint in the right direction from, from sort of classical literature. Right, from a human yeah, perspective exactly. that can't conceive of eternity. Yeah. I'll live forever by making sure the world always knows who I am. Yeah. 
not noticing that the world itself is mm -hmm. gonna yeah or, or you can see it in, in other things like there there's parts of like proverbs that talk about this mm -hmm. or up through the medieval world it's like hey uh, you know, have a family, have kids, your name will live on through them. And that's, you know, that's, that's something, right? And in mm -hmm. the Old Testament, I think we could look at that as, you know, again, an echo, a pointing forward. Mm -hmm. But it's this small thing that we as humans who are currently trapped in time, that, that's the best we can figure out right now. Yeah, we're the little mosquito in the amber. Yes. We can't see outside the amber. Yes. That was kind of a downer. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the amber is imbued with light there. Yes. That's better. And, and... <laughs> As we all <laughs> plod through Kronos, keep in mind, it's not just a series of Kronos before it stops. There's, right. to God, there's an ever-living present. The past isn't totally dead. The right. future isn't non-existent yet. It's all, it's all there. Mm -hmm. One day, maybe we, can, maybe we can step out of time and see it too. Mm -hmm. Just not right now. Just not right now. Not right now. Yep. <laughs> all right, so finally, we're, we're just about out of, you know what, time. Yeah. Um, so final, <laughs> Rapid round. You, you threw this okay, out there. I think uh -oh. it's interesting. What would, okay. we, because there's the common question, what would you do if money were no object? What yeah. would you do if time were no object? Okay, see, I, next time I have a question for you, I need to think of an answer before I Yeah, this is your question, I, Mandy. It is my question, but I didn't, if, in the, what would I do if time were no object? I would read all the books and <laughs> write all the books. <laughs> there, that's what I would do. All right. Well, I <laughs> would take my little world of my books that I'm working on. <laughs> and I would do the leaf by niggle thing where I try to make every detail just as expansive and um, in depth and probably utterly pointless as possible. <laughs> but I just keep world building and world building. World building and building. If, yeah. if temporal, you know, limited, finite, still, sin still sinful me were mm -hmm. to suddenly be able to step out of time in my current state, that's what I would do. Well, look at, see, your, your <laughs> so. inclination was toward creation because you're created in the image of God as oh, a thank fellow you. creator. You're a sub-creator. Oh, thank you. Well, that's what you just described. World oh, building, buddy. There, oh, there we go. There you go. There we go. I feel better about myself oh, now. Good. All right. Well. And my time here has been well spent. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, actually, I have an announcement that actually involves time of and art. Oh. Okay, so I mentioned this uh, a couple podcasts ago, but we have the Anselm Society Big Imagination Redeem Conference coming up this fall. And one of the things I really enjoy, and Mandy, I'm sure you will agree with me, is the, the art gallery that we have there. Yes, absolutely. So each year we have uh, an art gallery with different submissions from folks all, all across the country. And it's so, so good. The one we had last year was so good. And this year we're, we're doing it again. And as we speak right now, submissions are open. They will be open until June 30th. Uh, so basically here, here's what Anselm has provided for me to share with you. So the theme this year is artists, stories, and time. Ooh. Uh, so the gallery is looking for submissions that highlight the storytelling role of the artist, which we kind of talked about here, focusing on imagery that enfleshes God's narrative about time or explores what we should do with God's gift of time to us. So the gallery, like I said, is currently accepting submissions. Uh, entries for the in-person gallery and for a digital gallery will be selected for exhibition on the basis of creativity, technical execution, and narrative strength. Uh, some entries will also receive social media promotion uh, for the ever Kairos of Instagram, as Mandy would call it. Uh, <laughs> if you're interested in submitting a piece of visual art to the gallery, like I said, the deadline is June 30th. Uh, for more info, uh, visit us at anselmsociety.org. And with that said, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Our Kronos is running low, it seems. Uh, fire's down to embers. Customers are trundling home and you've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>